Hi. Thanks, Louis. Thanks very much to you and Kevin and Tracy for organizing this event and for asking me to chair and introduce Yvonne. Well, again, welcome everyone to this um, Southampton Research Seminar. It is um, my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Yvonne Tasker from the University of Leeds. Um, Yvonne is a prolific scholar whom I'm sure I don't have to introduce to most of you, but um, I'm going to take that pleasure anyway. So she is um, the author of many important and influential works, including um, several edited collections. She's co-edited with Diane Negra, Interrogating Post-Feminism, Gender and the Politics of Popular Culture, and the anthology Gendering the Recession, Media Culture in the Age of Austerity. And of course, has um, you know, consolidated or, or her, her authority in the field of Hollywood action and adventure films with that edited collection from 2015. Her single author monographs, of course, include her groundbreaking work on popular cinema and spectacular bodies, gender, genre, and action cinema, as well as working girls, gender and sexuality in popular cinema. Um, and her last monograph, which was the important foundational work, Soldier Stories, Military Women in Cinema and Television Since World War II, extremely comprehensive work on um, women in the military and media. She is currently co-investigator on the Arts and Humanities Research Council project, Jill Craigie Film Pioneer, which explores the political and filmmaking life of British filmmaker Jill Craigie, which she'll be discussing today. And I know we're, so we're all very much looking forward to. Yvonne has also been an important mentor for many scholars of feminist film and media studies, including myself, and has been central to the growth and development of that field in the UK. So it is I know the pleasure of many of us to be here listening to her talk about her latest work. So thank you very much, Yvonne. And I'll leave to you now. Thank you. Um, so uh, apologies, I am still trying to load my slides, which we had all on uh, display before uh, before you all joined. So oh, never mind. Um, so my talk today is called Jill Craigie, documentary realism and histories of British cinema. And these are all big terms, right? So um, I am inevitably going to um, uh, make some generalizations or perhaps speak um, in a little sort of broad brush terms. And I saw a number of people joining um, the meeting as we were uh, discussing whose work um, I uh, cite in the larger project or uh, who are, are mentioned indeed in this presentation. Uh, and thank you to everybody for coming and thank you to Southampton for inviting me. So uh, as Shelley mentioned, this uh, presentation draws on this ongoing AHRC research project um, called Jill Craigie Film Pioneer. And what we're doing in that project is exploring um, the political and the filmmaking life of um, uh, of Jill Craigie, uh, who I guess uh, quite a few people will will be familiar with. Um, uh, I'm gonna in this talk just briefly say something about the project, uh, and then I'll also talk about Craigie's sort of film and media career. And what I want to do in really broad terms is to reflect on. Um, the, some some things about the process of researching Craigie, and perhaps some unexpected findings or unexpected for us um, as we went through the project, uh, but also ways in which the work that we've been doing around Craigie can be located in relation to women's film history much more broadly, and maybe also British film history um, more particularly. And then in the final part of the talk, I'm gonna say some things about um, uh, particularly um, Craigie's feature film, Blue Star, which I hope that some people um, will, have, uh, will have seen. So um, I may give up on the slides so I can see all, but give it one more, one more attempt. So our project, the Jill Craigie Film Pioneer Project, is led by Lizzie Thin from the University of Sussex, So I think I saw entering the room at a certain point. Uh, Lizzie's made a documentary uh, about Craigie as part of our project called Independent Miss Craigie, 
Uh, and the title really nicely plays on this sense of what independent means in terms of film production, but also in terms of like gender identity. Uh, and I'll try and bring out some of those uh, issues and, and, and qualities through, through the course of the talk. Uh, and also as part of the project, I am co-authoring with uh, Sadie Waring from the LSE, a book on Craigie. Uh, uh, which is going to be called Jill Craigie Film and Feminism in Post-War Britain. So we're trying to sort of locate her within, broadly within um, gender politics at this time. And this is going to be published by Illinois University Press as part of their Women in Film History International series. And I mention this partly because it points to a much, uh, you know, pretty well established infrastructure of publishing, uh, around um, the kind of the area of women's film history. And that's not only around directors, but directors, women film directors are quite a prominent part of that. Um, and the fourth member of our team I should mention is Holly Price, a researcher who's also based at Sussex, who's doing some really fascinating work, uh, including around um, the kind of regional responses to uh, Craigie's films. So. I don't want to go over stuff that you already know, but in case you don't, Craigie was uh, a British filmmaker who wrote, produced, and directed a number of films between the mid 1940s and late 1950s. And as a director, she's particularly known for her work as a documentarist. Um, her first film uh, as director was Out of Chaos from 44, uh, 1944, which is a short film exploring um, the work of war artists and the place of art and of gallery going in wartime uh, Britain. And some people have perhaps suggested it, it sort of lays a, um, a, a grounds for um, art documentary in a certain uh, sort of way. Um, She's probably best known for her uh, film, The Way We Live from 1946, which is a drama documentary showcasing plans to um, rebuild uh, post-war Plymouth and highlighting the needs of families, particularly the needs of women. Um, and last year we, uh, as a team, uh, went to Plymouth and showed uh, The Way We Live. It's been shown plenty of times there before, but it was really interesting uh, to show that and also to show a first version of, of Lizzie's film, uh, Independent Miss Craigie, uh, uh, and to get some feedback from audiences there. Um, so Craigie wrote and directed one feature film, which is the one I'm going to talk about in the last part of the talk, Blue Scar, which is um, a, a, a realist drama set in a coal mining community and yeah. that builds on her earlier documentary work. Can I just check that people have come in and muted because I'm getting some feedback. Um, thanks. Um, thank you. Um, a, a few other details to mention just in contextualizing Craigie and um, some sort of interesting notes. And the first of these is that in 1950, um, um, that's interesting. Uh, in 1950, um, something strange has happened to my screen here. Uh, Craigie became the first woman to be uh, elected to the management council of the British Film Academy, so what is now BAFTA. And that was a role that she occupied for three years. I'm not going to talk too much about that. I've been working on that separately. But what's really interesting is I think that she's at the centre in some ways, or she's really at the heart of British um, film culture at this particular point, the end of the 1940s and into the 1950s. Um, shortly after that, she makes um, her film To Be a Woman in 1951, uh, which is, if you haven't seen it, a uh, fantastic feminist, short feminist film campaigning for equal pay. Uh, and it's available on YouTube, so you can actually get to see it. Um, Craigie didn't direct um, again for quite a long time after that film. Um, but she did retain a presence in the film industry in Britain as a screenwriter. And she wrote some successful films, including... Um, two that were directed by Ronald Neame, who she 
met while she was uh, on the British Film Acad Academy. So there's a kind of set of networks and connections. But in terms of her work as a director, it's documentary that she's known for, and I guess what I'm calling realism, and realism with a political emphasis. Um, uh, so her, her films as director are very much within that, within that mode. Um, in response to quite constrained, I mean, I'm skipping over quite a lot here in a way in terms of her story, constrained opportunities to direct and really a, a, a frustration uh, at the conservatism of the industry, she sort of drifts out of film in the late 1950s. But what's interesting, I think, is that she remains a prominent public figure, what these days you'd call like a media personality or a celebrity who worked in radio and television and journalism, as well as being an advocate uh, for feminism, for socialism, and for, for, for a better understanding of women's history, particularly suffrage history. Um, so she appeared on panel shows, uh, television programs aimed at women, uh, she had a column for the London Evening Standard, and the, you know, so she was both contributing to and appearing in a whole range of media outlets that associated her with an idea of independence, with an idea of feminism, and with an idea that filmmaking could be um, in some way independent, in some way challenging. And and I'm sure that we would, from an academic point of view, put some caveats around those terms uh, but that's the kind of media space that as a kind of celebrity uh, I'm suggesting she occupied and a quite striking feature of Craigie's post-war um, filmmaking career is her sort of dual like insider outsider status her relationship to the industry so she makes her first two documentaries out of chaos and the way we live um, through effectively through the rank organization um, you know, within a commercial uh, context. And then together with Leah McQuitty, she sets up an independent production company to make, to make Blue Scar, which is released in 1949. Um, so she's got like an ambivalent relationship to commercial filmmaking and also to the sort of Grierson group of documentarians, which she wasn't terribly polite about. Uh, uh, but it's also really interesting from a contemporary perspective that she was trying to make her films accessible, trying to use kind of narrative forms, trying to make her films popular in some way. Uh, even though the material that she's dealing with, uh, which is broadly kind of socialist feminist uh, politics, in politics sometimes, uh, isn't necessarily the, the sort of stuff of popular cinema. So when we initially started thinking about Craigie and developing this project, one of the issues we were thinking about was um, visibility. And I guess we were thinking about reclaiming and neglect, those kinds of terms. Uh, and I think we were all familiar with uh, stories about women whose careers had been either truncated by a hostile industry or ignored in some way. Um, within histories of cinema. That's not quite the case with Craigie because she has been written about and written about in interesting ways. She's not been forgotten in film history, but I do think she's often been marginalized. Um, so she's more often a footnote or a paragraph than a whole chapter, if you see what I, what I, what I mean. Ref to, reference to her is often in passing. There are some uh, there are some discussions of some of her films, uh, but but what we found was that there's often this expression of regret, this sense of here's, here's, um, here's a career that's been unfulfilled, that hasn't really um, uh, developed in the way uh, that it should have. And indeed, there were some commentaries at the time, like in the 40s and 50s, that refer to that narrative of, of a truncated career. Um, and sometimes that we kind of come to the view that what happens is that the films themselves get obscured by that because there is so much commentary on the obstacles that Craigie faced in her career, which undoubtedly is the case. Um, but 
it, that shouldn't obscure that to work that was um, produced. So our work um, uh, builds on the, the, the work of feminist film historians um, uh, in drawing attention to the scale of women's participation in and contribution to national film industries, that kind of noticing that women like Craig and many others have been uh, important figures within um, uh, different national film industries. Here we're talking about uh, the British industry. And one of the um, slides I was going to show, <laughs> I was going to show you, um, uh, which I don't think we're going to be able to, is a reference to some media coverage from 1946, I think, which has this little tag, uh, Britain's first woman film director or something like that. Uh, and regularly these things would appear in the press and people would write in and say, actually, that's not true. You know, so um, people at the time were saying, no, there have been other women. Um, you're, you're not really, you know, but this promotion of her as first or uh, uh, as, as um, a kind of pioneer was quite self-conscious and, um, as I'll suggest, was used by... Um, if not Craigie, then people around her to help promote her films as kind of novelty uh, factor. And it seems clear that at least some cinephile uh, contributors to um, uh, these uh, publications, like I think the Daily Mail has one such letter, which says, no, no, actually, there are other women who are uh, involved in film production. So we have to kind of uh, remember that it's not just uh, academic film history, but um, popular history. Um, so across our various activities of part of, as part of this project, they're making the film on Lizzie's part, giving presentations like this, uh, writing articles, etc. We are engaging with and telling stories about Craigie as a filmmaker. Uh, we're coming up with narratives which are informed part, in part, excuse me, by stories that we already know. And I'm thinking that one of these is like the forgotten female filmmaker. And we have to remember that they're often not forgotten. And when you start researching these figures, of course, you find that other people have written about them, uh, written uh, quite interestingly about them. Uh, so it's not a matter of forgetting as not noticing necessarily. Um, and certainly in terms of British cinema, there is a wealth of scholarship which has looked at um, women filmmakers. So the, the, the story of the forgotten woman filmmaker is um, is important, but I want to contextualise it and remind us that um, we need to be thinking about who's doing the forgetting, who's doing the remembering, and in what spaces and in what terms. Uh, and as I've already mentioned or alluded to, there's a risk that that story of neglect or recovery becomes the story rather than the other things that the story could be about. And in that context, I wanted to just mention a few things that we have been um, surprised by, I guess, or that have um, emerged through the process of, of doing the research thus far around Craigie. So firstly, um, we were surprised, I think, um, I'm speaking on behalf of others, but um, this is coming out of discussions. We were surprised to learn how much of a celebrity Craigie had been outside her uh, filmmaking, that she'd very much been a presence within um, uh, British film culture, as I've mentioned. We were surprised about the extent of her work in television and journalism. You know, that, that just because she'd stopped directing films, she didn't stop directing. She, she was um, contributing in other media. And I think the other thing, it's, well, one other thing that's worth noting is we were kind of challenged as well by the way in which Craigie's feminism and her professional choices read in contemporary frames. And I'll, I'll come back to that when I talk about Blue Scar, which is quite, in some ways, quite problematic and difficult from a feminist perspective mm -hmm. for contemporary audiences. Um, and I think the, the, the one other thing that I'll mention in this in this context of what we were surprised by the stories that we didn't expect to find is uh, how uh, how much Craigie, Craigie's film work chimes with and and in fact anticipates um, some key strands of British cultural studies. And again, this is something I'll I'll come back to with um, 
hopefully with Blue Scar. Um, so Craigie is very much a political filmmaker, not only in that her politics informed her films, but also in the sense that she viewed film in this period as the privileged space through which to um, get a message across. So when she makes her film about equal pay, she's like, this is this is the form that we should use. Uh, because film is is where it's at uh, in the late 40s, early 50s in in communicating urgent social issues. So she sees it as um, a means to an end in part. Now, I'm not suggesting that we are thinking about Craigie only in sort of sociological or political terms, uh, but I do want to, to, to make that point because I'm going to talk about realism and aesthetics of realism, and that's very much an aesthetic which we associate with the post-war period, um, uh, most obviously in an Italian context, but it's it's an aesthetic which is linked to a desire on Craigie's part to tell certain kinds of stories, political stories, and to make certain kinds of points. Um, so before I move into a discussion of Blue Scar, I want to offer two contrasting examples. And here's where the failure of my slides to appear is not that helpful, but I'm going to do uh, my best to, um, <laughs> to describe these two examples um, of critical reflection from the period where Craig is most intensely involved, um, where um, she's most sort of active as a director and what I want to do is just say a bit about reputation and status and the way in which um, cultural histories are produced, uh, the, uh, uh, the way in which visibility develops and the way in which marginalisation might operate. So um, the first of these um, comes from a book chapter um, from Katarina Lokopoulou, I hope I've said your name correctly because I did see you entering the room, uh, where she is talking about the first ever Arts Council um, of Great Britain exhibition, which she's surprised to learn is about film. So the exhibition is The Art of the Film and it's curated by Roger Manville. And um, so she reproduces the, the cover of um, this um, booklet which is celebrating film as a medium it's like from 1945 um, and um, oh slides <laughs> are appearing um, that's me I got um, them so I'll try to move through them for you Yvonne could um, you find this picture because it saved me having to explain it so let me go forward oh, oh here we are here we are so um uh, so we have this wonderful um, image, and I've reproduced it rather uh, uh, poorly here, but um, within this celebration of the art of the film is a, a still from Craigie's first film. And what struck me about, um, or many things struck me about this um, example, but that she is, um, and her work uh, is located in a kind of high profile, high prestige kind of um, uh, location where, um, and this is one can talk about arts, arts documentary as a particular kind of subgenre is starting to emerge and her film Out, Out of Chaos is associated with that. So you can see like the top right hand image is a still from Out of Chaos. It's got Stanley Spencer, he was one of the artists profiled um, in the film. So I, I see this as a real positive instance of reputation uh, building, which suggests that, that Craig is like an artist to be reckoned with. And with her second film, um, The Way We Live, uh, this was a film that was championed by uh, kind of newspaper film critics uh, uh, who argued for it to get a much wider release and really celebrated her um, as a filmmaker of, uh, of distinction. So you've got this kind of positive reputation building. And my next example is um, kind of negative, right? Uh, so this is the contrast with, this is a quotation from 
Paul Rother's book documentary film, and this is the only paragraph where he mentions Craigie. This is from the second edition of the book from the early 1950s. And he gives her credit, you see this here. So I've mentioned that The Way We Live gets this kind of big um, build up. Um, uh, he gives her credit for getting rank uh, to back the film. Um, but then he basically says it's no more than adequately directed and it didn't break any ground, which I, I simply don't think is true. Um, you might not approve of what it does, but I think it did break new ground. Um, and he rounds off the discussion. I didn't put it all on the slide uh, in this way. So he ends his paragraph with a brief mention of Blue Scar, which I'm going to talk about next, um, which he sees as um, failing to master its subject. So it's um, there's a small a, a paragraph devoted to Craigie, and it's grudging at best. And so this seems to me a way of like, she's there, she's acknowledged in this book about um, British documentary film, which is produced by a distinguished documentarian and he's in his own right, of course. Uh, but it's, it, it's, it's effectively suggesting that um, Craigie's not very good. So Craigie knew and worked with both men, with both Roger Manville, who organized the um, Art of the Film exhibition, uh, and with Rotha. Both of them were involved in different ways with the British Film Academy during the time when she was on the management committee. So uh, she had personal relationship with them. Uh, I, I don't know how good, or I don't know much about the terms of that relationship, but I think it's interesting, these poles of celebration on the one hand, grudging acknowledgement on the other, from people who were important within British film culture and um, knew her. And the other thing, I don't really have time to develop it, but I'll just mention it, um, is that in in letters and, and diary entries and so on, the correspondence from the time, she shares more the kind of Roger Manville version of, of herself. So Craigie is very confident about her own abilities as a filmmaker. Later in life, when she's interviewed, um, when she's much older and looking back, she seems to have um, accepted Paul Rother's view of her abilities and is very dismissive of her work. I wasn't really very good. Um, uh, I didn't really know what I was doing and so on. So she has a kind of version of herself as a failure um, in later interviews, um, which partly that's another narrative that shapes in some ways um, some of the subsequent accounts of her. So there are different sorts of neglect, really. There's the neglect, neglect within the industry, the fact that, you know, after she didn't get a chance to direct another feature. That was frustration, obstacles that she faced. But there's also different kinds of neglect, which is about the stories that we tell within our own disciplines about which women matter and how they matter. And that's a space, I think, that collectively we, together in this room, um, have a bit more latitude about. Uh, we can, uh, we've got sort of more freedom to uh, to move in that area. Okay, so I um, go on to. I'm just moving away from Paul Rose here. Uh, so this is a this is a still from uh, Craig is there on the right from the production of Blue Scar. Um, as my title suggests, right from the beginning, I want today to highlight. Um, particularly Craigie's documentary work and some realist modes of filmmaking during the late 40s. Um, the films that I've mentioned, Out of Chaos, The Way We Live and Blue Scar, all use documentary techniques to communicate particular aspects of everyday experiences. And it's noteworthy that for Craigie, um, and she's not the only filmmaker who, who does this, but for her, um, the category of ordinary people includes women quite prominently. That's why I wanted to have this image of laundry because uh, the battle against dirt is a prominent feature of Blue Scar as a film. Um, and that it's women's battle in a way. Women's experiences feature really prominently uh, in Craigie's um, 
films relative to the period, I think, but also in uh, what we see is like her kind of feminist and socialist politics, which is maybe not quite what we'd recognise in those frames today. But in interviews, she cites her interest, for instance, in William Morris and the idea of planned environments, more utopian ideas uh, of what the future could be like. Uh, how spaces, domestic and public, could um, accommodate what women wanted from um, from them as well as men, uh, and the idea of a sort of freer future, if you like. Okay, so I want to shift to Blue Scar. I'll come away from the laundry, and um, so this is just an image from the press book of um, the uh, uh, of the film, and it shows you the male star who's. Um, uh, prominent within um, within the film, we'll come to him. Um, this was Craigie's only feature as a director, although, as I mentioned, she was scriptwriter for some other, screenwriter rather, for some other feature films. And it does suggest something about the kinds of films that she might have wanted to go on to make. And you can also get some sense of this from her notes as well. I'm going to talk today about three aspects of this film. Uh, very briefly, the first two, the production of the film and the idea of independence, marketing Craigie as a female filmmaker, and then I'll say more about sort of realist filmmaking and the documentary mode. Um, and if you can see the quotation at the top of that, you might not be able to, um, it says that the film radiates sincerity which I can imagine actually being a quite negative uh, comment, but um, Craigie's films are consistently described as, as sincere. Um, so very briefly, the film is set in the mining valleys of Wales, and it focuses uh, on a particular village of Abergwynfi, and it has some scenes that are set in Cardiff and in London. And it's about the working lives of miners and their families, including the women, uh, and the coming of nationalisation, and also very centrally with themes of social mobility. And what happens here is you've got this um, central family who uh, it kind of these themes are enacted around them. And this this was the device that Craigie had used in the documentary, The Way We Live. And she takes it into the feature film as like as a good strategy to um, uh, make it um, more more personal in a certain sort of way and shifting that to um, to the feature film. So, um, yeah, so we have this kind of setting of a kind of, it's like both rural and industrial at the same time. So some of the shots give you like uh, beautiful valleys, but there isn't really that much of that um, within the film. It's more the sense of the evocation of uh, the pit and how that dominates the um, the village. Um, so in terms of production, together with Liam McQuitty, um, who'd produced both of the earlier films, Craigie sets up Outlook Films. So that's an independent company to make Blue Scar. And this is a bit of a gamble. They do get money from the National Coal Board. So mining, coal mining had been nationalised in 1947 so there's a big shift and that's part of what the film uh, is about um, and so there's this attempt uh, there's also some involvement from the uh, National Union of Mine Workers as well um, and support um, for the film so it's a bit of a gamble because perhaps this isn't a topic which is necessarily going to um, be the most exciting for uh, distributors and indeed uh, that was the case. There was um, something of a battle to get it distributed, which was successful. It did get a fairly limited um, distribution. Uh, and Craigie, her, in, in other roles, was quite active in arguing that independent film production, independent films ought to get a, a fairer access to distribution. That's something that... Um, uh, Margaret Dickinson and Sarah Street talk about in their book *Cinema and State*, from uh, which was published in the 80s. So there's, she's quite involved in these sort of networks. So it's an independent film, which is um, 
telling, I guess, a socialist story of a certain kind, um, although it's also quite ambivalent about the um, results of um, nationalisation. Um, Outlook Films allow uh, McQuitty and Craigie to make this film, to get on and shoot it, to press ahead. Uh, but they, uh, they really have to um, use some interesting devices to get, um, to get distribution. And one of them, and I'm not going to say that much about this, but one of them, which was used in relation to Craigie's other films as well, is about promoting her as a filmmaker. So um, a strategy of getting attention around her. And I've just got a brief quote from her biographer, actually, uh, Carl Rolison, who says, that she orchestrated a, a press campaign which highlighted her beauty, her unconventionality and her resilience. And this is just uh, an image of um, one example of such um, promotional um, material. And there's stories in some of the clippings um, in Craigie's papers about how she sold her jewels. I don't know if she actually did, but uh, the, the way in which she was doing everything she could uh, to, to promote um, uh, promote the film and surely this little film should be given a chance and so on. And as I mentioned earlier on, um, this replicates uh, the sort of promotion that you saw in, in earlier examples. So this one is from the one I mentioned actually from 1946, which says um, the only female film director in England takes stock of her look, takes stock of her looks considers the day's makeup. So it's kind of preposterous, but it's also not true. Uh, as I mentioned, she wasn't the only um, female filmmaker, but there's a way in which that kind of novelty, if you go back to the one that, that's around Blue Scar, is being exploited. So you have images of Craigie um, doing her research, um, uh, being in, um, uh, in the Welsh Valleys researching uh, the film. So the key thing I wanted to sort of talk about with um, uh, with with the film is this kind of documentary or realist aesthetic. Um, so in her documentaries, Craigie had used dramatized elements, and what you get here is a kind of flipping of that. So it's a drama that is using sort of documentary uh, elements. Um, this is something that a few people writing about the film have have discussed um, uh, in in a sort of Welsh context. Gwenon Fran Francon, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, makes that link to Italian neorealism and saying these kinds of features of uh, showing ordinary people, showing um, poor or marginalised groups, having a kind of low production values, a bit, you know, as in making films quite cheaply, using location shooting, using a mix of professional and non-professional actors, all these kinds of elements are clearly uh, at work in, um, uh, in Blue Scar. Uh, they're all kind of factors or elements that you, uh, that you can point to. And in terms of that broader issue about how you situate Craigie and films like Blue Scar, there is clearly a sort of narrative of national cinema where this film can be uh, located within a kind of social realist tradition of British cinema that is very, uh, uh, that's very strong. And one of the striking things about the film um, is this real sense of place that you get um, within it. Uh, and one of the other things that I just wanted to highlight is going back to the laundry, is the sense of the day-to-day -day rhythms uh, and routines of women's lives. So that there's a lot of kind of interesting scenes showing the minors, the men's lives, but also we see how the women are um, working and that, that work is often about kind of cleaning, uh, cleaning the, the minor's body, but also like laundry and so on. So the sense of like women's labour is of a very particular uh, kind. And let me just show you an image as well from the press book. And you can see if you look at what, what's called here catch lines, I guess I would think of them as tag lines. These are suggestions for how the film can be promoted. And that realism is seen as 
something you can use to promote the film. So uh, a gripping drama of real people, uh, romance, drama and fact, you know, these are um, elements which suggest that there is an appeal to, to, re uh, to realism or there is a realist appeal that can be made um, uh, to audiences. And in fact, um, uh, um, one of the questions that was asked of participants at test screenings uh, for the film, which um, uh, uh, Holly Price found for us, was uh, so the test screenings were asked, would you like to see more films of this type about real people in Britain? So the idea of this as a realist film was, was clearly quite um, conscious and I will just say that responses are mixed. Um, in his biography uh, of Craigie, Carl Rolison suggests that with a film like Blue Scar, effectively McQuitty and Craigie introduce a love story. So there's the story of the miners and then there's the love story really to get distribution. And it suggests that somehow it's crafted on, grafted on uns, in an unsatisfactory way. And there's this extraordinary quote actually, where he says that gradually this factitious element, that is the love story, will infect a film that promised so much, uh, so much more than conventional fare. So it's, it's seen as somehow there's the realist story and then there's the romance. And this is really sort of the last set of points I want to make. It's like, how do you, include romance or women as romantic subjects within a realist um, fiction, within a realist mode. And I want to make that connection partly because in response to that question that, that the test screenings posed about, do you want to see more of these kind of real people? At least one respondent said well yes but not this sloppy stuff not romance uh, and certainly some of the critical responses to Blue Scar suggested as well that what people really liked was the sort of supposedly authentic representation of minors and their lives but not the romance that that was somehow unconvincing unrealistic maybe uh, and uh, less absorbing than the, the portrayal of um, the miners' lives. And I'm not going to get, um, this is the last image that I have, I'm not going to get into a, into a big plot description, but if you haven't seen the film, the couple who you see in, in the valleys in, in Wales uh, are um, made up of the hero, who's a kind of... Um, He's a, he's a miner who's educating himself to get into a junior management position. And Alwyn, who is at the beginning of the film, receives a scholarship to go to the University of Cardiff to study music and who is desperate to escape effectively, um, which she does by marrying an English man and moving to London. And the scene, the interior that you, that you see there is her in their very small London apartment and we get this contrast between um, the domestic spaces and the exteriors of Wales and the kind of the cramped spaces of um, of London and um, it's been really interesting I mean I'm interested to hear what those of you who um, know the film well will think about this but it, it's this 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 figure of the um, social mobility through education, which both the male lead and the female lead are involved with, seems to me to be quite fascinating and of its time. And the resonance um, for those of us in a kind of more cultural studies tradition is with the later, uh, the book that was published a decade later by Richard Hoggart, Uses of Literacy, where he talks about the scholarship boy and, and the way in which um, the working class boy who goes to university becomes divided from their community and it seems to me partly what blue scar grapples is grapples with is an earlier version of that question and to ask what happens when it's a scholarship girl who's uh, looking to move away from uh, the version of life or the, the the kind of career that 
um, her family or community might expect for her, which is either to be a wife and mother or, and or to, to teach music, not to perform. So she wants to be um, an opera singer. And I mentioned earlier um, uh, uh, Gwenno Francon's piece about the film. And one of the things that she notes is that, that she feels that Craigie has contempt for this female character and her aspirations. And I'm not quite sure I agree, <laughs> agree with that, but it's certainly quite an uncomfortable uh, uh, com uh, representation of female ambition because um, the, the character of Alwyn is transformed. Um, she is presented as part of a London that is middle class, superficial, um, and false, <laughs> so really quite negative um, qualities. But at the same time, the film depicts very clearly what it is, what it is the kind of female life that Alwyn is wanting to leave behind. Uh, and it's not necessarily judging her negatively for that. I think that's left quite um, open in some ways. And certainly the mother figure in the film has other aspirations for her children really striking looking at it now is that the male character's aspirations don't involve him leaving, don't involve him leaving Wales and so that allows him to become like a junior manager, um, I think it's called an overman within the film. It's got a narrative for, for him about social mobility that fits with the conventions of British social realism, uh, whereas Alwyn ends up being a kind of femme fatale possibly not quite but um so there's a problem for the narrative of reclamation there uh if we want to say well we're looking back at craigie as a feminist filmmaker uh, i think we actually have to think about that in the context of the period and not simply say um kind of position her in ways that we would want to or position her films in ways that we would want to see them um behaving um playing out. It's not easy to reconcile Craigie's feminism with this sort of particular story, even though uh, she makes space uh, for women in her um, realist films. Now, um, I, I'm quite aware of time here, so I'm just going to take us back to an image which you didn't get to see. Um, this is a, uh, so this was the first line which you didn't get to see, which was um, a glamorous shot uh, of Craig. This is in the Tatler. Uh, and then this is a poster for Lizzie's film, which includes um, a still, which is from the set of Blue Scar, from um, one of the shower sequ sequences of the Met with the Miners. And there is Craig um, on the set. Um, and I think I will leave it there and um, you can have time for questions and comments. <laughs>